All right, well, thanks everyone for sticking around until the bitter end to hear the last couple of talks. Um, I'm Susanna Tringe, as Ina said, and I'm from the JGI, as is Ina, and I head the metagenome program there. And I was excited when Ina came to me and started wanting to talk about metagenome visualization because I realized it was something I'd really been struggling with for a while because not only do I have my own research, but I help manage this user program to do metagenome sequencing through the JGI. And we do all this metagenome sequencing and we deliver it to collaborators and I find it harder and harder to tell them really what it is and what we did and what we found because often they haven't worked with metagenome data before. And even if they have, conveying the things that we found in our process of analysis is really difficult to do. And so any kind of visualization tools would be incredibly useful in not only getting things published, but just communicating that information in an effective way. And so I, since not everyone here works on microbiology or metagenomics, I thought I'd give my one quick single, single slide primer on metagenomics. The basic idea being we consider anything metagenomics that um, make sure that that involves sequencing DNA from a whole community of organisms. And so genomics would typically deal with the DNA of just one organism or the RNA, et cetera. Um, whereas the uh, DNA from a whole microbial community, we call it metagenomics. But it, these communities can come from a lot of different environments, though we have some fairly specific interests at the DOE. And the reasons for using metagenomics are really varied, but I tried to capture, I think, probably the two most common ones here. And one is to access the genomes of uncultivated microorganisms. And this is just a bacterial phylogenetic tree, and everything that you see in black is actually phyla that don't have cultivated representatives. So if you were to only sequence bacterial genomes from isolate organisms, you'd just be looking at this gray stuff, and you'd never know what was going on in all these other branches. And so that in itself is a reason to do the sequencing, but it also turns out that many of these uncultivated organisms, whether in novel phyla or inside the phyla that have sequenced representatives, have important functions in the systems that they live in. Um, and then also, in theory, to gain a systems level understanding of a community like the human microbiome is really that acts on mass. Those organisms don't act as single entities. And so you want to know what they're all doing together, not just what each one is capable of doing. However, we're interested in really going even farther with metagenomics. And so we want to not only know about the organisms that are there and their genes, we want to know how they behave as communities, but then we want to be able to extend that information to habitats and ecosystems, and even the whole globe, because especially from the Department of Energy, we want to understand carbon cycling and how microbes impact on our planet. And so while we're learning a lot about genes and organisms, we're really struggling to bring these data to a higher level, although that is the dream of all these grants that are getting funded, is that someday all of these data will feed into some sort of global climate model. And so I think in order to be able to do this, we really need to be able to abstract information and visualize it. But starting at the most basic level, for the microbial ecologist, the most fundamental question for most micro microbial ecologists is just, who is there? And so they look into a sample and want to look and see what kind of various organisms might happen to live there. And the most conventional way of doing that, with DNA sequencing at least, is sequencing of this 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And the process is really pretty simple. This is actually a picture of the wetlands that I study in my research. Um, this is a sediment core, and then you can just you isolate DNA, you amplify the 16S gene with primers to conserve regions in the molecule, and then you take your amplicons and you sequence them with whatever technology you want to use, and you can build a phylogenetic tree and see who is there. Um, this is just showing um, that kind of data from an enhanced biological phosphate remover, um, removal uh, bioreactor. You can see that there are these new organisms here related to rhodocyclus. You can visualize them with fluorescence in situ hybridization, get some idea of you know, where they are in the, in the sample. But this kind of low throughput method of cloning and sequencing individual genes doesn't work that well when you want to start comparing samples and you're looking at really complex samples, you know, just building trees. You can't really compare a tree from one sample to another very easily. And next generation sequencing has really opened up the opportunity. So for a, probably a decade or two, microbial ecologists were kind of looking and saying, wow, look at you know, all these interesting organisms there. We've kind of moved past that just pure discovery phase to trying to understand you know, where they're distributed and what they're doing. And next generation sequencing is now to move to a type of sequencing where we're just sequencing some short region of the molecule so that we can cross it with next generation sequencing, barcoding all of our samples, and then generating amplicons from you know, whatever number of samples we have. Sometimes now we're doing this in the, in the thousands. 
And then we can build a table. You know, we cluster these sequences into what we call operational taxonomic units, or OTUs, um, because it's solely based on, a, based on a percent identity. We don't call them species, because we really don't know if they meet any kind of species definition. So we just have to set a threshold. We build a table, and then we're able to classify these, as well as do a lot of comparisons among the samples to start learning what they mean. And you can do this with kind of basic tools like the pie charts that have been much maligned here. And you know, you, sometimes pie charts work, because in this case with the human microbiome, the gastrointestinal tract is just wildly different from the ear, and you don't really need a sophisticated analysis to let you know that. And then there are you know, bar charts, this, and heat maps can start telling you a little more about the samples and the relative distribution. But in most cases, we have, we have anywhere from dozens to hundreds of samples. We have uh, thousands of organisms. So we kind of need to visualize this in a more, uh, more fine-grained way. And so in those cases, the ordination methods are really useful. This is a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot of data from soil samples. And this was an initiative that we started at the JGI to study prairie soils. And we had prairie soils from three different states, Iowa, Kansas, and Wisconsin. And we had nearby cornfields. And we had this basic question, you know, what what impact does management have on the microbial community, as well as climate and location of, of those soils. And we isolated a bunch of different samples from each location so that we could get some kind of reproducibility. We sequenced 16S ribosomal RNA genes with the 454. And we took all those data, built our big table, and clustered them, and then put it all into a plot where any two samples that shared species in common would be closer together than ones that were, that were dissimilar in their species composition. And right away, you can see that the samples from any given plot, which are colored distinctly, are more similar to each other. And that in itself was actually not totally expected. It was what we expected, but there was a school of thought that said that soils are just so wildly diverse and so completely different that for a microbe, you know, moving 10 feet over here is like a whole new universe. So you wouldn't see the same organisms reproducibly really anywhere. So that definitely wasn't true. But even more interesting, if you color this differently, and you look at the type of management that you have here, you can see that all of the cornfields are actually really similar to each other. And it doesn't actually matter whether it's in Iowa or Kansas or Wisconsin. And to some extent, that's really true with the prairie, too. The prairie samples are more similar to each other than they are to the corn. And we were really excited that we'd actually bothered to include this one sample from Wisconsin that was restored prairie in blue, because it seemed to be right at the interface between the two. And we thought, well, maybe it hasn't been restored for that long. When we looked, actually, it's been restored for more than a decade. But somehow, the signature of the microbial community persisted after it had been restored to wild prairie vegetation for a decade. Um, so just visualizing this told us something really significant about the microbial communities in soil and how management impacts on them, whereas the, the list of organisms would never have been useful. There were thousands of them. None of them were dominant. And the dominant organism in any pair of samples was not the same. So there are actually some good tools for doing at least these sort of straightforward analyses. And I'd say the, the project that has really put the most weight into visualization of the data, a lot of the, there are a lot of tools for clustering your data and such, but not really for visualizing them, is this um, or effort called CHIME, Quantitative Insights into Microbial Ecology. Um, Greg Caparazzo and Rob Knight are really the lead people in organizing this. And you can load your data or your OTO table and generate things like heat maps and taxon assignments and all these ordination methods. So there's been a lot of progress made in analyzing these just 16S data alone. Um, they also have a really cool tool for visualization called Site Painter, where you can upload an image of where you sampled. And and then match your samples to certain locations on the image. And then you can visualize your data relative to where it was located. This was a cool study of kitchens, where they looked at the abundance of different organisms in different places in your kitchen. And they found, actually, Clostridium is kind of all over the place in the kitchen that they studied um, at low abundance. Whereas Escherichia was actually quite rare and only present at these samples kind of down low and in the refrigerator. So they could quickly visualize you know, where are these things distributed um, using this kind of um, cool tool for visualizing them. But I'm actually a lot more interested in the next question in microbial ecology, and another one that I'm going to add in later, which is, what are these organisms doing? You can catalog a lot of organisms, but it's really hard to know what they're doing. Most of the time, 16S sequence doesn't tell you a whole lot about the function of the organism, unless you hit on something photosynthetic or something like a methanogen. There are some very specific lineages, but most of them can really do a lot of different things. And so in your community, you might have things carrying out things like cellulose degradation or photosynthesis. 
But in that, to do that, you need to do more than just sequence 16S ribosomal RNA genes. And so that's where the shotgun metagenome sequencing comes in and, and what we do a ton of at the JGI. And so back here, we have my wetland samples again. And this is even more straightforward because now instead of amplifying, you just take your DNA and you, you throw it right on your sequencer with whatever method you have. At the JGI, this Illumina HiSeq 2000 is what we use for almost everything. And then you can annotate your data. And so in, at the first approximation, you can do almost the exact same thing as you do with 16S data. You take your, your sequence reads, you assign them to some function using BLAST or whatever tool you have at hand, and then you build a table that instead of having OTUs, it has gene families, which may be COGS, they may be PFAMs, et cetera. And then you can build the exact same kind of plots. You can do ordination plots. This is a canonical correspondence analysis from a paper by Elizabeth Dinsdale. And they you know, showed that all these different, very different kinds of communities look different on the plots, and that you can look into what kinds of pathways are actually driving that. These are data from my wetland samples where we not only um, gen, you know, showed a heat map of all the genes, we clustered the genes based on their frequency in the samples, and we clustered the samples based on their frequency of genes. And we found that actually certain genes clustered together based on their abundance in the samples, you know, not based on any sort of pathway analysis or sequence level homology, this whole block of genes was very similar in its distribution, and those are all the genes in the methanogenesis pathway. And methanogenesis is very important in wetlands where you have an anoxic sediment. And they're actually not in the same samples as these nitrate and sulfate uh, reducing genes, which is expected because those are sort of competing pathways. This is more energetically favorable to use nitrate or sulfate as an electron acceptor. So we could see just from this high-level visualization and clustering that we have these pathways present in our samples, they're competing with each other, and they correlate actually with, um, with some of the biogeochemical data that we have from our sites. There are also tools um, emerging for doing these kinds of functional level analysis, and particularly in this system being built by um, the Department of Energy called the Systems Biology Knowledge Base. They have a microbial communities division, and they're rapidly incorporating setting some of these tools for functional analysis of metagenome data and looking, doing you know, overviews, heat maps, ordination plots, et cetera. Um, so I think this is a really promising forum, and it's one that we're really trying to feed tools into for things like microbial community analysis within the DOE. Um, but I'm still not satisfied with all of those analyses because now I know who's there and I know what they're doing, but I don't know who's doing what. And that turns out to be a lot more difficult question because in order to do that, you need to figure out what belongs to what genome and then how they're interacting. And so these are just some examples of studies we have participated in. This is a terephthalate degrading bioreactor where we could figure out, well, there's one organism that can actually degrade the terephthalate, but then there are others that take up its metabolite and carry, carry out different functions. This is from acid vine drainage, actually one of the very first metagenome studies they were able to do this. But in order to do this, you have to find a way to get the whole genomes, or at least some approximation of the whole genomes. And in theory, that's simple. You know, you have your sequence reads, and then you put them through a genome assembler, which just takes the reads, looks for things that ought to overlap, and stitches them together in, in bigger contexts. It's a little harder to do with metagenome samples because you have organisms of very different abundances. And most genome assemblers have this kind of underlying assumption that things should be at the same abundance if they're all part of the same genome, but that's not true in metagenome data. But nonetheless, this actually does work. You can build contigs if you have enough coverage. And then you still don't know what belongs to what genome. Sometimes you're lucky and you have a good phylogenetic marker gene on your contig, but most, most of the time you don't. And so you can use a variety of tricks based on sequence composition, et cetera, to try to sort things into genome bins. And then you annotate each of those genomes individually and generate one of these kind of cartoons of the metabolic reconstruction. It turns out this whole process takes years because uh, I, kn I know the person who generated this one, and it did take years. Um, it was her postdoc project, and we now we're looking at simple sam samples that don't just have two organisms that you're trying to figure out how they're interacting with each other, but they might be hundreds. And this whole thing kind of breaks down when you're talking about now having to figure out there's a hundred different moving parts. And so, what are we trying to do to overcome that? Well, first, I'll explain what the obstacles are to doing this community level analysis and why isn't it being done more often. It is being done, but not that commonly. Um, and some of them are purely technical. They're not really related to our analysis or our visualization or our data interpretation. There's that we have a lot of data, but often we still have sparse coverage of the organisms there. They're still so complex that we're not covering very deeply. Um, the computational demands of doing these assemblies and annotations are high. 
And then one of the most serious is really that the quality of the assembly and the annotation and your genome binning are all kind of questionable because you don't have any sort of internal control to know that you're getting it right. And you have to, because of these computational demands, you're usually making decisions at each place along the way that you can't easily go back and change in terms of your parameters for all of these things. But we're really making progress on all of these. I think there's still a perception that there's no point in assembling metagenome data, but I really feel that there is a lot of value in assembling metagenome data. And we're getting a lot of data. We are getting good coverage of organisms. We were, were able to assemble larger and larger data sets and annotate them. Um, we're working on doing better binning and sorting things out. But once we've got all that done, we still realize, wow, there's a lot of data here, and we don't know what to do with it, and there aren't any tools for doing this kinds of analysis. Um, you, don't, you have these really complex data, but you aren't, it's hard to tell what's signal and noise. And then that the data are really inherently multidimensional, which is that you know, each sequence really has an organism and a function, and that's what we want to integrate together. Um, and so what are we doing to solve that? This is a, a very recent project that I have with Ina. So these are more like mock-ups than an actual tool that you can do everything that you want to be able to do with. But even already, just being able to visualize these data um, has been quite powerful for me. So this is an actual wetlands sample. And even though only a small fraction of the data assembled, um, we were able to reconstruct what we think is more or less you know, some complete genomes out of it. And this is kind of a complicated plot, so I'll walk you through what we're trying to look at and what we're trying to learn here. Uh, each dot on this plot is one contig from our metagenome assembly. And we had something like 150 megabases total sequence in contigs, um, probably in hundreds of thousands of contigs. And what's plotted on here is the average read depth, meaning each base in the contig, how many reads contributed on average to that base. And the reason that's a useful feature is that if you have a genome in your sample, you ought to be sampling that whole genome uniformly. You shouldn't have contigs that are at a dramatically different depth. You know, even within an isolated genome, there are, there's a range, but it should be within some bounds, um, unless it's things like plasmids, et cetera, which I think we're pretty far away from easily reconstructing. And then on another axis here, we have the G plus C content, which is, again, a signature feature of genomes. Most genomes have uniform GC content, except for exceptions like gene islands. So what we should be seeing here is kind of clusters of contigs that belong to the same organism. And so for the final pieces of information here, the size of the dot is the length of the contig. So you can see that those dots are generally sort of larger as you get better coverage. And then the color is based on the phylogenetic placement using a program called Megan, which just uses blast hits to try to, try to place things in a phylogenetic category. And so now, instead of out of the original sequence assembly, what you get is literally like a FASTA file, you know, a bunch of sequences. A lot of assemblers, depending on how you run it, you don't even know the sequence coverage. Um, I've always found the sequence coverage to be, you know, a totally essential part of that assembly information because otherwise I just don't know what I'm looking at. But we, we generate that using the read mappings. We plot this. And then now I can say, wow, we actually got this whole organism at something like 600x, and it's an alpha proteobacterium. And we have this other organism here at, you know, 150x or something, and it's a methanogen. And now I can tell that, you know, before I've really done anything with the data. And so we're thinking, you know, we can generate these kind of plots pretty quickly. You can actually see some other clusters here that are a little less obvious that seem to be phylogenetically coherent and say, you know, this is what we think we have here. And then the next step is to say, well, what, you know, what are they actually doing? You know, what genes can we find here? And just as an example, I looked up all the cellulase genes because biomass degradation is important in this environment, you know, the plant material is being broken down and then ultimately converted to methane. And so I pulled out all the cellulase genes, plotted them on the exact same plot, and they were all clustered up here in this one alpha proteobacterium for the most part. There are some others scattered around here. But so that immediately says, well, maybe this alpha proteobacterium is actually breaking down the biomass. I know that this is making the methane. I don't even really need to look for the methanogen genes because this is such a phylogenetically well-defined group. And so we're really excited to keep expanding on this and make it so that you, these are dots. They're already interactive and that you can select a set of dots, redisplay them, export FASTA sequence. What we really want to do is link it up to the full annotation so you can just click on a dot, go see what it's annotated as. Because then you have things like, like these purple dots here actually I think turn out to be um, like phage. You know, they're not really part of a genome. They just seem to be their own distinct elements. And so that's what we're trying to do to learn, you know, what are these things doing without having to bin and reconstruct every single genome in the sample. <laughs>
So finally, I did say that we want to extend to the ecosystem level. I don't really have any good examples here, except for I have, I have one image of kind of where I think they're going. Um, because, like I said, we do want to go beyond understanding what's going on in the gram of soil or whatever that we collected to a much higher level. And so to do that, we really need to start thinking about the, the spatial and ge biogeochemical context. And there's actually a lot of data out there because there's been a really active standards community in metagenomics encouraging people to collect you know, all the data they can when they go out and collect, get GPS coordinates, get your, uh, your ion concentrations, your temperature, your pH, et cetera. But not all that much is really being done with those data as of yet. They're kind of all just getting archived. And so I think we really need to start integrating those with our visualizations, but they really don't necessarily belong in things like heat maps. Um, and so I thought this was just one example that I pulled from a, a, from a paper that, uh, that a collaborator of ours published a few years ago, looking at organisms in an oxygen minimum zone in Saanich Inlet off of uh, British Columbia. And he was interested in this organism called SUP05. And they looked and they sampled the, the water column at four different depths at four different times and then looked at the relative abundance of this organism. The two plots are just one based on 16S and one based on metagenome, which are actually very congruent. Um, and then what's plotted here is the size of the dot is proportional to the abundance of that particular organism. The white and black are just two different um, strains of that organism. And if you look at this in the context of this nitrate data that they also collected across the, across the study over time and over depth, you can see really where this organism occurring is all the places where nitrate is depleted. And so just by overlaying those two things, not necessarily doing a more sophisticated statistical analysis, you can say you know, you know something about what that organism likes to be and where it's, where it's going to end up. And so I really think that this is, I don't know what kind of tools we need to develop yet, but I think these, we need to look at our data more in context than we really are at the moment, and especially in these kind of spatial and temporal contexts. Um, so finally, in terms of a summary, I think that there are some really great tools already available for sort of organi organism-centric and gene-centric analysis, um, but they really focus on these unassembled metagenome data, and that we're making great strides towards assembling genomes and doing community-level ana analysis, but we really need tools for being able to analyze things at that level. And so finally, you know, unfortunately had to catch her flight, but she was the driver behind developing this uh, prototype that we have here. Henrik really did the programming. He's a uh, programming in her group. And then finally, um, really, the JGI is a team effort. And so I, I have tremendous resources to draw on. So everybody in this picture is really important for all of our projects. And finally, the Department of Energy not only funds the JGI, but they fund my early career award. And then I can take questions. Thank you.